Welcome to Five Pints In, the show where we're literally five pints in. Cheers. 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 So we've got a really special guest on the uh, podcast today, uh, Man City legend here, uh, Paul Dickoff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Ian, why don't, we, why don't we hand it off to you, give you a bit of the spotlight first, and then you can... Uh, you can introduce you your mate here. Me, then you can bim me. Yeah, yeah, and then you can you can sign pizza. off and we'll get going with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce one of my best friends in the whole world. It's Paul Dickoff. How are you, Mucker? I'm very well, Mucker. How are you? Uh, we're all doing good, son. All doing good. We've uh, told the boys a couple of weeks ago I wanted you to be my first guest. No, and problem. they said, they said, Who's Paul Dickoff? <laughs> I'm just going to say, when they said Man City legend, somebody just told me, and Bishop wants to speak to me, and I was thinking, who's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must, I must need an alibi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, Miami Fusion legend Ian Bishop here. Oh, uh, yeah, cheers, man. <laughs> so, Paul, thanks for, well, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, but we've got one question for you. One of the rules about the podcast is everyone has to be five pints in. At so. Least. Yeah, at least five pints in. So we have, we have to ask you, are you five pints in? And if so, what are you drinking? I'm not five pints of beer in. I've got um, I'm about four or five glasses of wine in at the minute. So the sun's been shining here in Manchester. So I'm sitting outside. Fuck you, man. Sunshine. Sunshine in Manchester. Sunshine in Manchester. <laughs> You'll have to send me a picture of that, son. <laughs> Speaking to me, my, what, my wine or the sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you sent me a picture of your wine? Yeah, I've done actually. Already, we do that anyway. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny you're getting sunshine there. We're getting rain here in Florida. It's been miserable today, but um, yeah. So so you're drinking wine, then Ian. What are, what are you drinking? Because you, you you divulged earlier you're not drinking uh, beer. See, this is where, see, it's supposed to be off the cuff. You know, I've told you earlier, and you just said. Well, I've me just up. said you've. I just said you told us earlier, just but you, to you call have to. You out on the podcast. Yeah, we have to we have to let everyone know what you're drinking. Yeah, I'm drinking sangria. Pints of sangria. And then your husband is drinking what? <laughs> Have you got an umbrella in that as well? <laughs> Monsu, Monsu. <laughs> Sangria, what's wrong with that? If it's if it's in big glasses, what's wrong with it? As long as it's get, get on with it anyway. Yeah, get on any... with it anyway. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Paul, we've got we've got some some good questions for you here, but we just want to start off with, I mean, the question that everybody has for for everyone in the world right now: What are you doing with your time off? Uh, not a lot, if I'm being honest. Uh, I'm getting bored. I've never, I don't think I've ever drank as much or run as much since I played. Uh, uh, especially with you, Bish. But, well, I've done your run anyway, so that won't make any difference. So, um, But no, you know what? It's actually quite nice. I've been doing a lot of travelling recently. Um, the Man City and um, all corners of the world. And it's just nice, nice to be at home. And the surprising well, yeah. thing is, the surprising thing is, um, we've got three kids that are at home, obviously Jan. Uh, and then we're not strangling each other yet, so it's so all is good so far. How long? How long do you give it then? Because I'm I'm going a bit stir crazy, staying indoors right now. Uh, well, how long's a piece of string, <laughs> uh, Jordan? Do you know what I mean? It's like um, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know what's like over there with you guys, but um, I think this lockdown thing's going on indefinitely at the minute. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> look, it's an old idea if a bit of laugh and everything else, but. I was one of these at the start a few weeks ago that when it sort of started, I was a bit blasé about it, sort of saying, I will be fine, and it's just a bit of flu, but obviously it's good, it's good really serious over here, and um, I think as long as everybody adheres to the rules, sorry to be a bit sensible about it, but um, hopefully we'll be out it sooner rather than later. Well, when he, when he talked, Jody, about the, you know, the drinking and the running when we were back in the day, he was, <laughs> he was one of them people that could do both. <laughs> I wouldn't profess that I was. Um, <laughs> I saw it I more. Sort of... I saw it more as you were the drinker and he was the runner. That's well, no. <laughs> well, well, you see, this is what you've got. To, this is what we bring him on for, so we can find out all the little nuances of what he was really good at. I, there's no, there's no doubt. I, I don't know if you remember there was an episode in Derek where Carl Pilkington's character, character's the bus driver, and he turned around and said, "Derek, you're like a wasp on a bus." That's what Dickie was like in training. <laughs> He was I like a night out. <laughs> night out, yeah. He was everywhere, trust me. And and them days where you'd been out with him, you knew for a fact how much he'd drank and how much we'd all drank. 
and then we're suffering the next day in training, thinking, ah, you know what, we'll go a bit easy. We all know what each other's been doing. And then there was him, just a, <laughs> just a man on his own, that was just flying around all over the gap. You just you just hoped he was on his team in the side or yeah, the keeper. I was a freak of nature, but um, I, I put that down to my, my upbringing at Arsenal, Bish. Uh, with the lads there, um, <clears throat> with the Tuesday club and the, obviously Tony Adams, Paul Merson, Ray Parler, Steve Ball. Yeah, bingo, bingo that. day, bingo. Yeah, it yeah. was, and, and, and the guys were amazing because they, they went out and they, and you know this, Bish, they, they went out and you, you talk about work hard, play hard, and play hard and work hard at the same time. And Yeah. You know, that group of players love drinking, but the next day in training, if you weren't at it and you weren't on it, you get left behind. You yeah. know what I mean? And the, the lads used to sit down and say, look, the gaffer knows we've been out the night before. He knows we've been out the night before. So you are training the best training session you've had today. Or, or we're all getting it. And yeah, well, George, that's where it came from. George could have a few bottles of wine, couldn't he, as well? <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He loved his wine. Yeah, I mean, he it's great. We had, we had that a little bit with Joe, didn't we, mate? He, he knew he had a camaraderie in the dressing room and, and he didn't mind us going out for a pint because he had a beer himself, so... Uh, uh, but I think them type of managers, like you say, if you're not up to it on the training field, you, you'll soon know about it and he'll soon stop you. Well, he wouldn't exactly. stop you because we'd, we'd always find a way of doing it again when we want. We would. And, and, and he trusted us to, well, to a certain extent. Um, yeah. and, and he knew if we were out the night before, he knew the ones that were at it the next day in training. And, yeah. and because and because Joe was like that, Bish, and we used to speak about it a lot, he wanted to do it even more for him. Yeah. I'm not saying but because he let us go out and have a drink, but he let us... He let us all be ourselves as long as we got there. <laughs> well, we'll get to we'll get to some of the stories after what, what, he didn't let us have a drink. <laughs> was it was it more of an ego thing at Arsenal? Because I feel like if I went out, I would be the one. I would want to be the one to drink the most, and then I train and want to be the one that trained the hardest. That's my boy with the yeah, first uh, bit, anyway. With the first bit, yeah. No, no, I wouldn't say it was, it was an ego thing. It was. I mean, yeah. I was a young kid at the time, and if, if you actually. From, from my perspective and the rest of the guys in the youth team and the young guys that were first year pros if, if the lads invited you out the first team lads invited you out it was a huge compliment to you yeah you know but because they were really close knit and and I remember even going back to the youth team days and there was so many talented players that when I first came down from Scotland I felt so far mm. out of my depth um, but was that were, your first drink, Dickie? Was that your first, or, you know, being Scottish, did you start when you were about no, seven I, years old? Yeah, and I was about four, I think, <laughs> my first game my first drink. And don't, don't, yeah. they also, don't they also say smoking stunts your growth? <laughs> it does, I, I wouldn't know about that myself, <laughs> one day, if I'm being honest. <laughs> to get it but um, probably my first proper drinking was, yeah, when I was down at Arsenal. You know, I was a young kid in London and my own. I left home when I was 16 and all of a sudden I was stuck in this city and... I've, yeah, I've what a city, what a city, mate. I know, it, it, unbelievable. And I spoke to you, I actually hated it for the first six months. I just wanted to go home. And then oh. once I went out a couple of times, I thought, this is actually quite all right down here as a young <laughs> lad in your own. Um, and enjoyed yourself. But, um, did you start on the log of Shandy's like we did? Or no, look, lag tops were put into straight Lager away. Lag tops, yeah. yeah. You're, look, you're advanced. Yeah. Um, and then, the, before you know it, the, you're out in, in Dover Street Wine Bar, you're in Covent Garden, with the, <laughs> the, the likes of Tony Adams and everybody else. But, you know, I'll go back to what we saying at the start, but it was a compliment that actually invited you out. And, you know, a, a lot of the younger lads, and I didn't realise this till I was probably Arsenal three or four years. Um, when you're on your youth team, I'm not saying it's completely different now, but, you know, you're cleaning the changing rooms, you're cleaning the boots. You're a yeah. bit of a target for the first team lads. You know, Big time, yeah. always, Especially at Christmas, on, yeah. mate. Christmas yeah, they're, with they're, the uh, initiations. They're yeah, they're getting to do stupid things. There, you walk in the first team changing room. If you don't knock on the door, you get a slap around the head, and yeah. and all little things like that, which you could never get away with now. Um, and I remember we were out one night, and there was Tony Adams, there was Steve Bolt, who's an unbelievably top guy, looked after me. Um, and I sort of said to him, "All that, but not it would get called bullying now, wouldn't it? Which it yeah, wasn't. Yeah." It was, it was testing your character. And I was saying, what was that about? And they said, well, we need to know as a first-team squad what young lads we can trust, whether we're on the training pitch, but more important than Saturday. <clears throat> he said, and the two young lads that came back every single day at the same time, before MD left the first team, to take the abuse, to take the banter, was you and Ray Parler. He said, that's mm. why you and Ray Parler are out with us now. 
Well, one, because you can both drink. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and two, because we know that you're on our side in training on a Saturday that we can trust you. Yeah, I've seen a couple of videos where Ray's actually still at it. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny how different it is now, though. But I mean, one thing is: do you think that do you think that sort of camaraderie from back then? I mean, it's a different type of camaraderie that there is in the dressing room now. Do you think that's sort of what shaped the game into becoming less physical? Or I don't, I don't really know how you'd put it. But do you think it's had a big effect that sort of change in the dressing room on the game today? Um, I, I think there is. I don't think you'll ever get the camaraderie that and some of the squads out in this, but especially the 99 squad for Fish, which was yeah. just amazing. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but the teams I was remotely successful in were, were the teams that had the best team spirit and the best group of lads um, and the managers who, who managed that well. Um, and it wasn't towards the end, the end of my career. I wouldn't say the camaraderie's going out there. I just don't think they're allowed to, guys, anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, God forbid, and, and thank God that there was no camera phones around when we were playing. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've got a few videos we can post. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So far, <laughs> they were done on oh, purpose, though. That's most of them were done on purpose. Yeah, going yeah there. of course no. they were. Um, and and, and but I look at the guys now, and it's just impossible for them to, to do anything. And you know, I know a lot of them would like to go out and have a drink and have a proper night out, but they just can't. You know, would we would we have sneaked out, Dickie, you think? Would we if we were playing today, would we have found a way? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we always did. Would you would you have ended up upside down in a bed in a wall? <laughs> Absolutely. It would have been it would have been that Andy Dufresne just filled his bed full of pillows and he snuck out with a poster. <laughs> sure <laughs> shank. Uh, yeah, he's tunneled he away, yeah. Uh, yeah, we always found a way. <laughs> Even at 47, I must all find a way, but don't tell John. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a little trap door at the end of the garden, yeah. and a dummy of himself sitting outside drinking a glass of wine, haven't you, son? <laughs> but it's life size as well. It's one of the little. Um, it's one of the little dolls I just sit in the, <laughs> in the corner. It's why it's why he didn't want to FaceTime video. He's covered in his yeah. camouflage gear. And he's got your bushes sticking out of his hat. <laughs> hey, not for the first time. <laughs> no one me, would it? Mate? Back it up. Did did you uh did did both of you did you find that you had better chemistry on the pitch with the lads you were you were out with more often? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, um, but you, I think it goes hand in hand. You know, I think if your mates off the pitch, you automatically click on the pitch. Yeah, well. I must have. I must admit, I must admit, like, like I had a few moves in my time, and I know you did eventually, Dicky. But um, when I moved, I sort of, I said to myself, "Oh, it's going to be different now. Maybe I should slow down my, my lifestyle." And um, you know, these these are new teammates. Maybe if I set a a different, you know, if I, if I start out a different way, then I can maybe slow down my lifestyle. And you just end up gearing towards the lads that that are like you. And it just yeah. ends up starting yeah. all over again, but in a different place, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, but I think that goes in, um, boys, that it's, even if you move if you move to another club, if you get another player coming into the club, Football is such a small world that everybody knows everybody. Yeah. And 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 me and Bish had bumped into each other a few times, and you know certain players at other clubs, and you, you call them up and say, "What's he like as a lad?" And they say, "Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He's fantastic in the changing room." And you automatically, from the first day they come in, you you, you get together, don't you? Um, yeah. And I think well, we, we just we, we just yelled straight away, didn't we? I think it yeah. helped that we room with each other, even though there's some stories behind that as well. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just one. It's just one of them things. You, you know, before lads are coming into the change room, or before you're going into another club, because you speak to people all the time, and you know the lads you're going to get on with. And, and and to be fair, I don't think I could probably count in one hand. Oh God, what did I play for? Thirteen clubs, including loans. Well, one hand, if that, of the amount of decades that were involved in yeah. all the clubs yeah. that were in, because because everybody was the same at that time. You, know, you wanted to enjoy yourself, but you wanted to have a career, and you wanted to make sure that whatever you were, that you, you first of all you backed yourself, but you backed your teammates at the same time as well. Yeah, it almost seems like there was a 
you know, a, a football, I mean, there was a football culture, obviously, but it's like you, if you were going to make it back then, you almost needed that sort of, um, that spirit inside of you that sort of drove that, again, going back to the camaraderie again, you know? Well, in all, in all honesty, Joe, there was, there was clubs, and I did see it at certain places, where the, the non-drinkers were sort of, sort of cast aside. Yeah, yeah they you know, upon, weren't they? Yeah, they frowned upon. Yeah, you, you, it was like, almost like a lack of trust. You know, you, yeah. you wanted to get up. I, to always each, remember, you know? I always remember you after training one day. Me and you went for a pint, and oh god, was the act which was which day was that? Like which that. day was that? <laughs> no, but that that was every day. But just one day that you said this to me. <laughs> Actually, you said it to me every day. And you went to me. You went. Okay. <laughs> He went, well, listen to me now. He went, let me tell you this. He went, never trust anybody that doesn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he, I remember him telling that to us when we were when we were five years old as well. <laughs> That's what started us off. It stood you in good stead, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought. Well, both of you, all of you, all of you. <laughs> you make me feel like the granddad now. Well, <laughs> you said it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I always was, wasn't I, mate? I was always no, the yeah. granddad. No, always the granddad. Always looked after us. He did. It's it's definitely more independent now with the I mean, you see the likes of uh, Benzema snitching and ratting out a bunch of his French and Real Madrid teammates. And it's feel it feels like no one can even go out and see each other the other teammates after a game or anything without them getting fined. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's that's without the 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 social distancing that's before yeah. that that's the way the, that's the way the game's gone yeah yeah well mate well mate you know what I mean for me obviously I, I didn't realise at the time obviously being an Arsenal fan since I was a kid that I was obviously a fan of you because you played for the team that I grew up supporting as a boy but obviously didn't get to know you until we we became teammates and we've we've had a couple of conversations recently and one name that, that has cropped up with everything good in the game is Dennis Bergkamp. Oh, man. Now I know you you played some games alongside him, and and he's a he's a favourite of Connor's. So, Connor, yeah. if you want to uh, if you want to quiz him, Go feel on. free. I, I just uh, I mean we obviously all saw I mean we see the footage today you know like uh, uh, I mean I wasn't alive at that time really or. Um, I was too young to be able to pay attention, but I think I got the end of his career. But... I don't think I was alive sometimes as well. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that later on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just I, I wanted to ask. Um, I mean, I feel like I already know the answer, but I, I, I imagine he was better in training than he was on the pitch somehow. Uh, well, um, just the exact same. And he, it's yeah. one of these people. That's the one question. Sure, you get asked the best. Who's the best player you played with? Yeah. Who's the best player you played against? And without a shadow of a doubt, the best player is Dennis. Yeah. Um, he was. Just... That's his. That's his nickname for me. Yeah. <laughs> Den. Yeah. Dennis the menace. Yeah. Den. <laughs> yeah. Dirty Den. Eastenders. Yeah, that's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was just. But he was just the complete footballer. He had everything. What a lot of people don't realise. They see his assists. They see his goals. They see his touch. He was nasty as well. He yeah. didn't mind leaving an elbow in and oh yeah, um, and he had every single attribute. And for, for me, I, I just thought he was the best player in the world. And to to be in training with him every single day, like I, I played a handful of games with Dennis in the first team, which people will say, you know, he didn't play a lot of games at Arsenal and this and that. But I don't. <clears throat> I had seven and a half years there, and it was the best football education, probably life education, I've ever had. Um, and to be in training with players like Wrighty, Dennis, up against Tony Adams, Steve Bold, Martin Keon, it was just that, that, no doubt I would, I don't think I would have had the career I went on to have if I hadn't experienced that every single day and just see how good was, these players were. Mate, was, was Platy there as well? Because we, we had a thing last week or the week before about, you know, top players, English players, I think we sort of leaned to, and he wasn't mentioned, David Platt. I know no, no. his his goal scoring record as a as a well what what was called a midfield player I don't believe midfield players go from the halfway line forward but no. did you did you did you manage to play alongside him yeah, I, I, did, I was there what did I you think of him um, and I loved him and he sort yeah. of changed I know the mentality Arsenal changed when when Arsenal came in 
but obviously Pat had been out in Italy for four or five years and, and came back. Um, and his whole he's, the discipline about how he trained and how he looked after himself, and he was just it was one of these. It was a little, and, and boys, you probably won't remember it. Um, well, won't be able to compare it. It was a little bit like Frank Lampard in a way, where he just used to. I was about to say that, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it would be in the middle of the parks, really doing all. And before you knew it, it would be in the box, um, scoring a goal, and, and that was plenty for you. You know, he'd, he knew how he timed his runs. And I think if you're looking at the best English midfielders, I think you're right, Bish. He's, he, he never ever really gets mentioned in that. Yeah, it's, oh. it's funny he didn't he didn't come up last week. I mean, the reason we 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 started talking about this, and this is a sort of a good segue into the next question, is we did uh, a segment on can you name? It was actually an argument Connor and Ian had last Christmas. Can you name ten players better than Paul Gascoigne? And Dennis Bergkamp actually didn't make Ian's top ten. So, Paul, what do you think? Would you put Bergkamp above Paul Gascoigne? Would he make it up there? Yeah, I would have to. I would have you to. Have Gascoigne to, was yeah. a genius. You have yeah, to. Gaza, yeah. Gaza, Gaza, Gaza was a genius. He was, and um, but you know, I'm, I'm slightly biased, and it's not the Arsenal Tottenham thing. It's just that I've, I've seen Dennis um, up close every single day, and you know, as a, as, as a forward, even in training, if he made a run, and Dennis, it wouldn't matter if he was ten yards away or sixty yards away. If you made the run, you'd have to look over your shoulder to see where the ball was landing. You knew if Dennis was on the ball that the ball was landing at your feet. Yeah. Just, just to uh, protect myself a little bit there, fellas, to be <laughs> no, fair. No, 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 you don't I get know, to do that. I know that. we're sort of three <laughs> against one, and it is going to get worse, but I actually two, had Bergkamp. Two and a half. In my... <laughs> <laughs> two and a half I men know. against one. <laughs> <laughs> See, I had Bergkamp in my Zola and Cantona group. So oh, they were... You had didn't much... I? To be... It yeah, was, fr- be yeah, it was fringe, and you did... You They're did... the ones I couldn't quite... I couldn't quite, and if I was put on the spot... I said no, but them three were the ones closest for me, the hardest for me to judge. Yeah, I mean, when, when Camp, we, Cantona, you made a whole, Zola. you made a whole Burkham group with Janola, Malatissia, Zola, Shearer, Zidane. Um, I mean, when well, we asked yeah. you, oh, you got a good memory, haven't you? He's yeah. got yeah. it on his phone. He wasn't drunk enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's got you it on his phone. Five fights. Yeah, uh, nightmare. That's cheating. <laughs> but yeah, it you, wasn't enough. You win in the argument, con. We did. We did ask you, and you made some weird noise we've never heard before. You know, so you're on the fence. <laughs> Don't know where the fence was. <laughs> <laughs> Involuntary noises. <laughs> that happens when few, you get old. I've heard a few of them. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get to the roommates later. Yeah, he was yeah. sitting on the fence, literally. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I just I, I would just say Dennis all day long just because I had the, the honour of um of being in the same pitch whether it be training or, or on a match day. He was just he was just phenomenal. And did you know what off the pitch as well? He was a really funny guy. Really dry. People had this yeah. thing about him that he was really quiet and kept himself to himself, but he was um, Sometimes they're the worst, mate, aren't they? They are they are the quiet ones are the worst ones. Um and um, he made a really dry sense of humour, and, and I think the biggest, especially at that time as well, because there wasn't a lot of foreigners actually coming in, to, um, and he got accepted straight away by the boys, and his first training session, he was, the lads just stopped at one point and just started clapping their hands and were shooting at the end. I mean, he, he was just that good. He was coming off, uh, he was, obviously, he was decent at Ajax when he was a kid, and then he went to Inter Milan, didn't he? <clears> and <throat> he had a bad season, and then everyone wrote him off. And then he went to Arsenal and obviously did what he did. So I mean, in my opinion, he's he's my top. He's in my top five, one hundred percent. Well, Dicky, oh, yeah. Dicky, Dicky, do, do you think it's because of the quality of the the squad they had that it was it's sort of blocking you a little bit? You know, you proved to everybody that he was as good as they come as a as a front man. As a, I mean, I mean, I remember. I'm not going to blow smoke up you, Jacksy, but. I used to Again. watch you run and pass. <laughs> I used to... <laughs> no, not without uh, 10 pints in, to be honest with you. Yeah, you can't do that from, this is a from story six... from a night out. You yeah. can't do that from six feet away, social distancing either, can you? Well, that's fair enough. He could. Because he's a more experienced smoker. <laughs> I was going to say blower, but we can't. Well, <laughs> next question. But, uh, no, the thing was with you, mate, do, do you feel like that the quality of them players sort of blocked you going forward. I did something for BBC Cumbria yesterday and, and they were asking why I left Everton and I said, well, 
There's about five or six reasons. Kevin Sheedy, Peter Reid, Paul Bracewell, Trevor Stephen, Kevin Richardson. You know, it was, for me, it, there's, there's sometimes it's a time to go, you know what I mean? Did you feel that way? Because Absolutely. of the quality and, and, that was in front of you? Maybe, and, and maybe, Bish, if I look back now, not, not maybe, I maybe should have left a little bit earlier. You know, I, I went down as a young kid when I was 16, left home, small town in Scotland, and I left, I was there, what, small <laughs> town? What was it, Lilliput? <laughs> Come on, son. And at, at that time, there was um, Arsenal had this unbelievable reputation. They'd, God bless them, David Brocastle, Mickey Thomas, Kevin Campbell, Martin Hayes, Tony Adams, Martin Keon at the time. All these kids that came through the youth system and they had this <clears> reputation <throat> of giving them a chance. And as much as I was in and out, the first team squad, probably from 20 to 22, I was always in the first team squad. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but usually, but usually 14th man sitting in the sand, yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. or getting on the bench. And but because of the the quality I had around me and the way the Arsenal as a club looked after me as a young kid, I didn't want to leave where I made the <clears> on. <throat> and even then, looking at that, I mean, ahead of me there was Alan Smith. Ian Wright, Kevin Campbell, Dennis had come in, Paul Merson, Johnny Arson had come in. Yeah. You know, and all these players, they, they, they were like, I, I was never going to break through, but I, kept, I, I was clinging on <laughs> to being there because I was always in the yeah. squad and getting that yeah. sub appearance and then getting the odd start in the cups. Um, and I always remember going back, and I must have been about 19, I think I was. I just played against Oldham in the cup and scored two goals. Um, they won 3 0, and there was a spec who had this young kid that came down from Scotland. And George Graham done an yeah. interview on the TV after the game and basically said they were asking about who, about me, and had done this and the future, the future of the club. And, and George <coughs> actually said, he went, I'll tell you one thing about Paul Dicker. He, he said he will have a very good career in football. Never right. played at Arsenal. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that's, that <laughs> rang a bell with me as soon as you said that. Yeah. Uh, but at 19, and I just scored these goals, I didn't even think about it. But I look back yeah. now and I think, it, it was absolutely bang on. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was never yeah. going to get to the levels of the, the Wrights, the Bearcamps, the Mersons, and all these people I was up against. But he knew right. because of my attitude and how yeah. I applied myself and the bit of ability I did have, <laughs> that I would have a good career. And... Um, well, I had, a, I had a similar thing, similar thing with Howard Kendall when he let me go from Everton. I know he put a sell-on clause to Carlisle, which, in my eyes, said that he still rated me. And he thought, without actually saying the words, he thought that I was going to be somebody, and he was covering Everton's backside by letting me go and having a having a sell-on clause. Going just just going back to the, make it extra special because I've been doing some research as Connor has. You, you know, after after leaving Arsenal, did it make it extra special when you went back with Leicester and scored at Highbury? Um, do you know what? It never bothered me, Bish. It never bothered me, because whatever... And I, I know I took a lot of stick, um, especially when I'm back with Leicester to City and scored, and I celebrated. Yeah, I remember, I remember was the, was the knee slide. Did you do a <laughs> knee slide then? I, I absolutely did, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got away with it. Yeah, but I was playing for that. But, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the Leicester Arsenal thing in a minute. But um, that game when I went back with Leicester um, to the Etihad with City, first time since I'd left. Um, it's the only game I've ever been cheered on. Right. And booed off. And booed off. <laughs> and booed off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the City fans at the same time. But um, I mean, that. The Arsenal thing, because it was the Invincibles, I had, I had this thing, and look, I've got a massive, massive soft spot for Arsenal, and everybody knows that, because they were brilliant to me, but, but they were going for the Invincibles, and in my head, the way I was, and you know what I was like, I was a little different yeah. times, yeah. I, I was just that focused on on doing my job, and yeah. if that didn't stop in Arsenal, um, getting the Invincible things, we were already relegated to Leicester, so we really had nothing to play for so but going into the game I was just thinking to myself I want to stop these guys doing it right you know and and yeah. I knew I, I also knew I was on the verge and there was a lot of clubs because Leicester had been relegated had, had a clause in my contract yeah. and there was, a, there was a lot of clubs that, that wanted to come in and get me because I just played in a relegated team and scored 14-15 goals that season for them yeah um, 
So I just went out with the mindset that I was just going to be my usual self, as in. So you thought gonna... you thought you'd take Leicester down and bin them? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're already, we're, we're already down. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and, Go on. And I was, I was actually I was close to staying at Leicester because Mickey Adams was brilliant with me, but um, <clears throat> because I just had a, a good season back in the Premier League. I'd missed out a season in the Premier League because Kevin Keegan had sold me um, to Leicester. And then I was I, I wanted to stay there. I wanted to play as high as I possibly could. Um, and the two great seasons at Leicester. What was that, and, five foot four? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, 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 that was my problem. No, I thought I was six foot two. <laughs> and, Sorry for interrupting, son. Come on. No, and, but I just wanted to, to play at the highest level. And I spoke to about seven different clubs, and in the end, they still had the house here in Manchester, and the kids were young. Um, I spoke to Moyes at Everton, um, spoke to Harry. Um, he was at Why does seven spring to mind, mate? Why does the number seven spring to mind? <laughs> because I can still count them all. <laughs> Hi, yo. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. And. I went and spoke to Graham Soonest and so he just said to me, he was Blackburn manager at the time, and he said, look, before you went to City, um, I was signing for Southampton when I left Arsenal. I was actually on my way down <coughs> to sign for Graham when he was manager there. And then he um, got a phone call from Jordi Armstrong to say, Alan Ball had been on, can you sign for City? And Graham had always wanted me since then. And the fact to bring the family back up to Manchester and... And Graham, yeah. out of all the managers, I wouldn't say he was the most honest because they were all great. He was, I just, I, I liked how he spoke to me. He said to me, I, he basically said, we are missing what you can give us. And he went, I'm not going to bullshit you. He went, what have other clubs offered you? If I offer you this now, will you shake my hand and look me in the eye and give me your word? And I thought, I thought, yeah. And you know what it's like when you're moving clubs. People are penny pinching and they're saying this and will you come for this and can you go for this and maybe this, that and the other thing and Graham was just up front and I was yeah. literally in his house for 10 minutes and shook hands with him and that was it. Happy days, mate. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we're skipping forward a lot here. We've got obviously got a lot to cover. Um, one thing I wanted to say was jumping from Arsenal, you were talking about how you should have jumped a little earlier. Um you know, just with, with the talent that, that you had ahead of you, obviously you had determination to jump into the first team and, and in the starting eleven. You went on loan a few times, but as a City fan, I mean, I am I can say I'm extremely happy that you made that, <laughs> that leap, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners will, will agree with me. Um, and we'll get back to the on-pitch details in a little bit, but obviously that spurred on to what you're doing today um, as an ambassador for, for Man City. Um, can you Can you just touch a little bit on I mean we've got obviously West Ham Everton fans listening um, can you just touch on on a little bit of what what you're doing with Man City today and, and what what that ambassador role entails and means for you yeah uh, it means everything to me um, and I think like a lot of the boys especially go back without keep going back to that 99 season that got of players if they're not City fans now and I'm sure you agree with me bitch, that they've got a massive soft spot for City Big because, of, because of how the club is and, and was back then you know it's an amazing club it's a family club um, and after playing with them for a couple of seasons you, it's very difficult for the club not to get to you and, and become a Man City supporter so so for me now still working for the club and representing them um, in all corners of the world it's it's just an amazing thing you know I'm, I'm a lucky boy and the stuff I do ranges from God, the last year or so I've been to been to China, Japan, the States, India, Indonesia, Australia, <laughs> Egypt, um, and any time the club have got an event on, whether it be a fan event, a lot of the stuff's to do with the partners they've got, because the club's got that big now, but every every country and every continent in the world wants to be a part of Manchester City now, because of the success they're having, and, and for me to be able to go out there and represent them and do the media stuff around them and meet the fans out there, it's, it's an amazing thing to do. Um, but- well, the boys, the boys know also, Dickie, that, that when we go back uh, and they they come to the games, when we have taken them to some of the games, you're treated like a hero, aren't you, mate? It's yeah, you, you, you could be you could be easily forgotten, you know. 
for, for the length of time it was, especially me. I mean, I know you went back, but um, for for it to be twenty odd twenty odd years, and and I, I, I won't forget, you know, what they did for us with the reunion, mate. I mean, I know we can touch on that a little bit later, but um, just just going to the games, just just turning up for for any individual game, and, and taking people with you. It's um, the, the way you treat it is, it's like nowhere else. It is, it is, and you know the from the fans, you know, as soon as you get the car park, the fans are on you straight away. You know, they're, 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 they're the best fans in my point of view, um, but because they never forget. But then I also think that the owners don't get the credit that they deserve, and the people who work at the club, because everybody sees Man City now as the City Football Group. They're owned by billionaires in Abu Dhabi, and but they don't forget the past. You know, and as you said, when, when, when any ex-player, whether it be me, you, or the go Andy Morris and Kevin Orlock, whenever they go back, they, they literally treat you like heroes, and it, it shows that that they never forget. And, and one of the big things for me about the club is even going back to the main road days. You go to the Etihad now, and there's people like you know Danny Wilson, who was working in the ticket office 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Vicky Kloss, you know, Chappie. Yeah. The, the, yeah. It, it's still surrounded by people that worked. So, so as much as the club's moved on to a ridiculous level now, they, like they didn't. They didn't. They didn't just take the people, did they? They took the attitude and the camaraderie and and the family environment. Even though it, you know, the game went corporate, I still think there's an element of family about the club. You know, oh, it wasn't that. It. I, and I seen it. The, the massive difference. And I speak to West Ham fans all the time. The massive difference between. You know the the environment of Upton Park and and what it is now in the in the London Stadium. You don't I don't feel that with the transition from. I know people do miss Main Road and a lot of good things happened while we were there, but it's not the same transition. It's been an easier transition to go to the Etihad. Maybe yeah. success success has something to do with that, but it was before the success. You still had that feeling that they brought the family environment from Main Road into the Etihad itself. It is, and then it was at the forefront of every day at the club, whether it be past owners or the present owners, to keep heart and soul of the club there, because that's what Manchester City is all about. It's about the fans, it's about the community, it's about the family feeling, it's about the ex-players, and, and, and they've got it down to a T. And I honestly do count myself very lucky that that I'm involved with the club in these times where they've been successful and, and doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I laugh and joke about it, and <laughs> it's probably true, but, you know, it's amazing what one goal does 20 years ago. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and what a goal, son, what a goal. Yeah, I know, but even and going back to that, you know, that talking about the success helps. The success helps massively because I don't, I don't think, and I know about the reunion um, that, that we had last year, which was amazing, that the guys were saying, like, maybe 10 years ago that game was, it was important to the club and part of the history. But I think because of the success the club's getting now, it sort of magnifies from... But because they're winning Premier Leagues and they're winning quadruples and getting 100 points, and it's a, it's, a, it's a much nicer story for everybody to, because they're winning things now than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was a Gillingham game that got us out the old Division 2. Now people are saying it was that game that was a catalyst to, to where they are now because they're winning Premier Leagues, if you know what I mean. Well, Con, if you, Con, if you remember the other week, we were talking about goals and assists, and, and Dickie was a goal scorer, and, 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 and he. he well, to be fair, he would have got more goals if he didn't if he didn't do his strike partner's defensive side of the game as well. That was one of my things about him. And I meant to say it earlier, we, we sort of digressed a little bit. But he would have got double the goals he has in his career, which is still very, very creditable amount of goals anyway. But you would watch him be on the right side defensively when, when the other keeper's got it. And the ball would be thrown out to the right back, and he would run past his his centre forward partner to go and close that full back down. It was just the way he was. It was in him to want to do that work. So if he wasn't doing all the extra stuff and being able to get it's well, look, I can sort of relate it to myself being the one who drops deep. How can I drop deep and start things and then be on the end of things? It's it's not always going to work like that. Um, but but this the Wembley thing it sort of like relates in a way to I got my pleasure out of assisting because I didn't score that many goals so the Wembley thing was more like an assist to what 
to what came after. Yeah. The success. Yeah, but, Go on. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. And but it's it was in my makeup to do that. And you know, people say to me, "Oh, you didn't score enough goals." <clears throat> or uh, you know, I never said that. that. I never said that. Yeah, yeah no, no. <laughs> but, 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 but that's the one. Yeah, but honestly, one hundred million percent. And you know this, Bishop. It didn't bother me whether I scored or not. You know, no. As long as I knew I was doing my job on the pitch, what yeah. I was supposed to do, what my team. Well, my my point was, if you did more than your job, what I wanted my, to do. My point was, yeah. mate, you did but, more. But, you did more than your job. You did other people's job as well. Yeah. yeah. That's I, the point I, I was getting to. to me. I, I, I remember you saying to me, <laughs> I'll be it in a pub again. <laughs> why don't you? <laughs> why don't you just stay up top? Well, why are you doing yeah. his work? Why are you? Why are you running past your other centre forward to go and close him down? And I'm like, well, that's me. That, that's my makeup. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm yeah. good at, and and that's what gets me going. Do you know what I mean? I could, there's no way I could have been a centre forward, a number nine no. or a number ten that, that just stood up there. No, and, and no I don't. Way. I don't know why I said that actually, because I remember in my in my days at West Ham, Alvin Martin used to say the same to me. Why mm. do you come back so deep to help us out when we've got possession really deep, and then you're getting yourself in trouble? Yeah, and I said, "Well, that's I don't think about that. It's just a natural thing that I do, and I, I couldn't it, possibly it, change it." And, and deep down, you knew that's what made you tick and made your teammates tick. Yeah, you, you doing that was the start of it all, and me doing what I was doing, I knew that made everybody else tick. Yeah, you know, if I knew I was closing a full back down, it's infectious, isn't it? I know everybody else is going to fall with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I don't do it, then before we know it, the ball's going to be in our own half. And they're going to be in the attack. So it was just, and it goes back to knowing what you're good at as well. And, uh, and I was good at being a pain. Well, in you that can't teach that, mate. You know, you can't teach yeah. that. That's in you, or it isn't. It is. It's the, it's the desire to, to just be the best you can all the time. And that's all I ever wanted to be. I knew I was never going to be somebody that was going to get the ball and beat five, six, seven players and stick it in the top corner. <laughs> Unless my kids were three and four years old, do you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, with them. I, I knew that wasn't me, mate. That's so, that's why I was that's why I was always last to go home from the pub. <laughs> I wanted to be the best at what I did. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Paul. It was well. just in me. It was just in me. You, you taught me well. <laughs> it was like a royal rumble. So you can't teach that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Paul. Um, I, I kind of have a two-part question. Uh, what? just happened within the last five minutes um really quick uh one i just wanted to ask uh do you think you would have fit of it fit fitted in sorry fitted in that's easy for you to say yeah right fitted in with How many uh, are you uh, in? <laughs> too many at this <laughs> point honestly seven right he's definitely fit them in <laughs> he fitted them in yeah fitted. Do, do you think uh you would have been better off as a front three instead of the traditional like with the four formation back then it wasn't as um no one was as creative and it wasn't as fluid it was more exactly yeah, yeah. do you think you would have been no. better off as a front three and gone yeah if you could uh answer that really quick no, well, it was. It was always. It was all we knew was four four two, Bish, wasn't it? There, exactly. No, exactly. There was, yeah. there was no difference. Yeah. And do you think you were no changing? It, yeah. it, it, it's, it's a diff, it's a difficult question to answer because we didn't know any different, you know. But I always I always remember um, when I went to Blackburn um, and Mark Hughes. Oh, well, I signed for Graham, Graham soon as Mark Hughes came in, and actually went to a sort of four three three four five one um, to begin with because we were struggling for relegation, and I was the the number nine, and I knew a lot of people were saying, what's this little short arse being doing as the number nine? We're never going to be able to get out. But, but, I, but I actually really enjoyed it. because It was actually a number north because the bottom part of the nine was tucked in your shorts. <laughs> it was, it was nice. <laughs> you know, it used to be like that because it was one, one size fits all. The short sleeve used to be like three quarters on me um, to get it done. And, but, but, but playing as that number nine, I really enjoyed it because when you're up against two two centre halves you can stand in the middle of them and yeah. they, they, they don't know who to pick you up and it was actually it made me think a lot different about the game because I was always used to being a two as two centre forwards being up against two centre halves yeah yeah but all of a sudden there's this one centre forward up against two big centre halves playing the Premier League and, and you switch um, off between the two yeah yeah no but, but I just, at times I just used to stand in the middle of them and, and, and let them work out what they were going to do rather than 
me having to work out what they were going to do if you're one against one, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and, and yeah, so yeah, to answer your question, it's a difficult one to say. Would it have been better back in the day because nobody knew any difference. But once I went to a nine up front on my own, I, I did actually really enjoy it because I could stand still, I could come short, and more often than not, I would I would run the channels and and then yeah, one against one, and then you back yourself all the time to go and do something. Yeah, but you can actually toy with them like that as well, Dickie. When when it's two up front, the centre half know, oh, that's my man. If they cross exactly, over, I'm going to wait yeah, for him to come. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just going. He's yeah. going to pass him on. So when you when you that one against two, you can sort of tease them and go over to close to one, and then now he's got to pick it up. And as he comes to you, you'll back away again close to the other one because they don't want to be on top of each other. Because that's Not the whole good. point. That's what you need to to occupy two to create that's space for they, other people. They, you know, they don't want to be on top of each other, but at the same no. time. They, 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 they don't want to be left isolated, and that was no. the biggest thing I found. Yeah. You know, and, and you find that if, if you stood in between the two centre half, <clears throat> they would question each other. Yeah. If you stood in, in between the full back and the centre half, the centre half would always, always bring his full back right in, more or less, to Martin. <clears throat> because yeah. he didn't want to be left isolated one on one, you know, and it was. And actually, I'll probably say I enjoyed that more playing as a nine than I did as a two at times. As by yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. definitely have a lot more freedom. I I always saw you as a um, as a over Mars mixed with Aguero type. And wow, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm throwing out big names. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, we're, and, and now we want to ask if you'll come on again the podcast uh, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <We're> just... <Yeah. laughs> No, that, I'll that, come on again tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I am being honest though. That's that's how I I saw you if I were to mix any two players together. And um, I mean, I am bringing up the I am bringing up Aguero, and I, I don't know if this little early to ask this question, but I I have all I have always wanted to know how you felt about the Aguero goal in 2012 with the QPR and all that. And I've have you seen like the um, the YouTube clip? Or something where um, they put the Gillingham game audio from from Aguero scoring that uh, goal. No, the Aguero, Aguero audio, Aguero audio, audio on, with the Gillingham yeah, video. The, I think they did the both. Video, yeah. I think they no, did both. They did both. Okay, yeah. yeah. They flipped it's the, uncanny. It's they, absolutely uncanny. No, yeah, it, it is. So, to answer the first question, I'm gutted Sergio scored that goal. He stole my thunder. And, nah, yeah, I'm joking. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I wanted to know. That's what I wanted to know. No, look. Hey, look, I celebrate. For me, that's, and I'm not saying this to be humble. That goal is is the best Man City goal ever, and to, to win the league in I that agree. time and and everything else. And you know, people no, say, oh, stop he, pulling he, him up." No, 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 but people say, "Sergio stole your thing." I don't mind. For, for Man City, after where the club were when I first signed I to agree. that QPR game, for them to win the championship in the way that they did, typical Man City style. Um, that's amazing, um, and for me, I, 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 I can go to Man City games now, and just I've got a huge man crush on Sergio Aguero. By the way, I, I, <laughs> we all do. I, don't I, worry. I, I, Wait a minute, <laughs> which one's the huge man? By the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could literally, I could literally watch City for ninety minutes and being a striker, just watch Sergio Aguero. Yeah, and his movement, watch his movement and yeah, what he does and everything else, and you know he's no he, he's defenders. Just, yeah, he, he's one of the best, if not the best striker. But the thing, the thing is, and I, the thing is, and I know City fans say this all the time, so it isn't me saying it. The biggest difference between the two goals is that one wouldn't have happened if the other one didn't. Exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? So, so as far as importance in goals, yeah, Dickies wins it hands down. Uh, look, I don't mind getting mentioned the same breath as Sergio Aguero. <laughs> never mind playing. Yeah, second, I wouldn't mind that either. But it never for, for the goal. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, Except when they say but, Sergio's uh, great, but Ian's <laughs> even better. Just yeah, say, brilliant. Yeah. But mate, what it is? It, I mean, we, we, we will, we will get to, we we will get to Wembley. But what I don't think a lot of people realise, mate, that you actually scored the equaliser in the semi-final against Wigan before that, yeah. right? Which was to me just as important. I mean, I was injured. God knows how. At thirty-five years old, I. I pulled my hamstring for the first time yeah. because normally you can't pull a hamstring unless you run fairly fast, well, and which was something I never, never did, never had. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, you're probably playing with us in the back garden. 
And I think I nutmegged yeah, that, you. That might have been it. That might, might have been it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of nutmegged you and then I scored a banger. Yeah, and then you, right. and then you I didn't. I didn't fall in the. I didn't fall in the fish pond, okay? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, more. <laughs> you did, I remember that. Uh, you, actually did, you actually did more than once. So, we're not so anyway, so, so, so that semi-final away, the Wigan game, I was injured. I was actually at Main Road, watching it on the big screen with the fans, and it was, it was probably better than being at Wigan. I don't know how you felt there that day. Yeah. It wasn't the, it wasn't the best ground to go to, Dicky, was it? But, you know, for, for me. To sit with the city fans in in the Kipax, it was I think it was about seven or eight thousand watching the game on the big screen. And, and yeah, how I mean, amazing! How amazing were the fans that season, Bish? By the way, mate, it was it was unreal. But well, well, the be- the beginning of that season, mate. Because don't forget, I'd signed towards the end of the, yeah. the season before, maybe four or five games left, where the club were going down. And um, I remember because I'd come back, people saying to me, "That's it, I've had enough now. Uh, I've taken all I can." It's the lowest point ever in the club's history. And, and as a supporter, I'm not coming back. And I remember, I, th- I think it was Blackpool at home, first game of the season. Yeah. Full house. I remember us talking about it the week before. Yeah. Thinking, oh my God, what, what sort of crowd are we going to get? What's going to happen, yeah. And Full house. What sort, of, what sort of reaction? And it was, a, it was about 30 degrees, Bish, wasn't it, that day, walking mm. down the tunnel at Main Road. Mm. And we walked out and there was 30,000 fans there. And it was just like, wow. I mean, it doesn't the, sound the, a lot, but it was full. Yeah, yeah, it, was it doesn't packed. sound a lot, but it was, it was full. Yeah. Yeah, it was packed. And, and the atmosphere was unbelievable. Yeah, and and then some of the crap they had to go through from from there to the Christmas time was just... But it seemed it seemed the worse we got <laughs> as a team, the worse the results got, the more they got a kick out of it. Yeah. The back is even more, didn't it? Yeah, they did, yeah. Like, every, every town we went to, every club we went to, every city we went to, they just they just took over the place. It was a cup final, wasn't it, for everybody yeah. else as well? Everybody yeah. raised the game. City would come to town. It was. I, I think that helped us in the. I know we didn't start that season too well, but I think it helped us that it was. It was a case where you had to step up. You, you know, going to Lincoln and and York and and places like that. Don't get me wrong. I'd been there before, but I'd been there with Carlisle. I'd been there with a a massive club who were, you know, I'd been used to being the underdog. But and now all of a sudden, it was sink or swim, wasn't it? In the end, that's what it came down to. It got, got to the point where, especially <clears> on this <throat> season, I don't know about you, Bish, but I think it was, for a lot of us, it was a massive culture shock because it was everybody's cup final, every ground we went to. You know, and they were up for it, whether it was at Main Road and they were coming and whether we were going to places like Colchester or Lincoln or York or all these places that, it shouldn't have been a surprise to us, but we struggled to come to grips with it. And it probably wasn't until, I think, in between Christmas and New Year, we played Wrexham, where actually Terry Cook right. um, absolutely battered us, didn't he? He was in loan at Wrexham at the time. Yeah, yeah, he um, did, yeah. He ended up 1-1-0, Gerard Deacon scored. Did Gerard score, yeah, Gerard yeah. scored that day. And then the Stoke game, where we went in 1-0 down at half-time, and it was probably the first time in a while that the fans had properly turned and it, it, I don't even remember it kicked off at half time yeah and there was finger pointing there was a couple of pushes there was people calling each other everything else and, and to be fair to Big Joe Big Joe just sat back and said nothing and as as it, as it all sort of finished and he went okay then ladies remember because used to say that <laughs> yeah. it, it, it basically went how about you stop talking in here because talk is cheap and you go and do it out there. And we went out in the second half and the blatter stoke and ended up one and two one. And we didn't look mm. back after that. No. I think we lost two games towards the end of the season because um, we knew we'd, look, we'd so much quality in that team, didn't we? To, to, yeah. be, to, to be where we were. Um, I think we were 12. Yeah, it was surreal. It was surreal, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, we could have got lost and looked around and, and, and got caught up in the whole. Uh, shenanigans of it all of, of oh, you know what we're too good for this yeah. we don't deserve to be in and lose sight of what you had to do when you actually went out on the field uh, and it wasn't a case of saying it you had to go and prove it and yeah. I think that's that's what drove us on a little bit I, I believe and, and then it comes back to what we said earlier about you know fighting for each other in the dressing room yeah and, and, we did and, have you know that and, and I am going to blow smoke up your ass here because you were brilliant 
mm. with it as well. Because the lads used, used to get really heated, and especially me. I was a, I was a nightmare, wasn't I? I used to get so <laughs> hit up and want to run around and kick people and everything else. And and then... That was just training. Well, no, yeah, it was, but then old old granddad here just used to say, "Oh, uh, no, 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 gramps!" No, 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 but, no, but, no, but, I wouldn't mind that I was only thirty-five. <laughs> yeah. And it was like but you just used to say things like, "Whoa, okay, just let's play football." He's like, "Listen, he, he, here, all the son. time." He, 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 he just used to go, "Calm down, and let's play." Let's, Calm down. Let's, Back let's, in my let's day, do, <laughs> let's do what we're good at. And it was so true, wasn't it? But because but if we all, as a squad and as a team, we calm ourselves down a little bit and not get caught up in it. Yeah, I, I must. Think... I must admit, I have said it. I have said it in the past. I honestly believe Joe brought me in because of the um, the chaos that was happening at the club at the time. We had like fifty four pros when I signed. Fifty six, and I know pros, which is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. It was. We did what all the other managers who came and stayed there for a short time and failed. We've been given money to buy players and give them good contracts. They didn't want to leave and, and get less money, which is half understandable. But yeah. it ended up that when what Joe inherited was a massive squad on big wages and he needed to change the whole environment yeah. of, of the club and the dressing room. And I, I do believe he brought me in to bring the dressing room together. I know I did have some abilities as a footballer that he thought I could use, but I do honestly believe... I did have a bit of a reputation before that of it, it was bringing the whole package of bringing you in. Fish. It was the the quality. It was the what you bring to the changing room. What you bring to individuals. Because you used to sit down and you, I was taking the piss a bit there, but you you were the senior pro. You'd been there. You'd been in the Premier League for God knows how many years. You know, and you used to take people forget. All right, there was you and Andy came in, Tommy Wright. But it was quite a young squad. There was people yeah. like me and Kev who were 26, 27. But Jeff, Whitley, Jeff Whitley. Jeff Whitley and Michael Brown. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Lee Crooks. Weaves. Weaves was a baby. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Those Vaughnie, Edgy. Vaughnie, Edgy. And even people, remember Gary Mason played a lot that season. Danny yeah. Alsop. All yeah. these young kids, that they, they needed help and needed guidance. But but when, when you're a low... Most people look after themselves, don't they? Yeah. And and that's what had happened at the club. But, but when you and a few other characters came in, and I, and I will say, look, yeah, I'm a mucker and everything else. I will blow some more up your backside. You know, <laughs> I was exactly what the club needed. Oh, and, 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 and Joe knew that. Joe knew exactly what he was getting when he brought you in. And it, it, and it was it was a genius move. I, oh, think... I appreciate that, mucker. Hmm. Why did you I never think... tell me that when I was with you? <laughs> <laughs> we were too busy getting up the mystery. You're probably too drunk. That was way too sensible. <laughs> I think it was, yeah. That, I, that conversation could never have happened. I think a lot of a lot of fans don't don't you know, my like myself included, I watch football, I mean I watch City every weekend they're on. You don't think about that, what what goes on in the dressing room, you don't think about those club players. And I think that uh, you know that's what we really saw when company left after uh, last season. I mean, we saw a captain leave. You know, we saw that that sort of that that voice in the dressing room disappear as well. And and you can talk all day about how good he was on the field, but like it it really makes an impact on on how he is in the dressing room and how people like that were in the dressing room. And and again, not to bull you up, Ian, like Connor did last. Uh, episode, but oh, you can uh, if you want. Well, I, I'll steer clear of it, you know. For <laughs> but, oh, um, it, it, I think I think it's 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 becoming evident that it's extremely important to have those players in the dressing room like that, you know. No, it, it is. And look, I, I still don't believe, and I know Bish will 100% agree with this. I don't think Joe gets the credit now that, that he deserves, but for no. what he did, you know. And, no. and if you take into context now, I'll, I'll go back to. But when I first signed, I signed on the on the Friday for Alan Bob. Um, didn't train. One against Stoke on the Saturday sub at half time, and Alan Ball gets sacked on the Sunday. And I was like, oh, "Cheers, mate! Thanks for that." Um, Jesus. But then, this was the end of August, beginning of September. From then to the January, I had five different managers, <laughs> and, 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 each, and each manager was allowed. So I'd obviously had Alan Ball. 
Then had Asa, Asa Hartford, Steve Coppel, Phil Neal, and then Frank Clark in January. So every single manager, and it's not their fault, were allowed to bring in their own players. <coughs> and and then Frank Clark was allowed to bring in, given a lot of money to bring in players. So so when Joe came in, and he'd, he'd 56 pros, and you think that Premier League clubs now have 25 in a squad. Yeah. He'd 56, and the whole atmosphere around the place was poison. And I don't blame the managers or the players, because the players didn't want to leave because they were on big contracts. But how, how Joe managed that whole situation and, um, and was able to get out the ones he wanted to get out, keep the ones he wanted to keep, and then bring in exactly what the squad was needed was, was genius for me. And I remember sitting down with Joe at Park Lane, and he, he, he pulled me in one day and he went, and ironically, Bish, it was, it was your first full season. It was the season's Division 2. And he said to me, Wigan, I've just come in for you. And he went, Dickie, he said, I don't want to leave you. He said, I don't want you to leave. He said, I want to keep you. He went, but we need to get money in. And he went, what do you think? And I went, Gaffer, I'm not going. And I said, I'm not going. I said, I want to stay here and get us, and at least try and help us get out the mess that we've got ourselves into. And he went, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. He went, cheers. <laughs> um, I thought you went, um, you've just signed Bish, and I've heard he's a scream in the pub. Yeah. And I want to sample some of it. I think he thought, I've just signed Bish, so I need to get rid of you. It's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but that's the thing. Well, I managed that whole situation. Yeah, but how do you manage that whole situation? And especially in look, when they brought Jock Andy Morrison in, Jock gets rightly so, so much credit for it. But, Mate, frightening man, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Wasn't he? he, he was isn't he? <laughs> I remember um, he brought me down for a penalty in training. I don't know if you remember this, but and w- Willie gave a penalty, and Jock was raging and raging, calling me everything under the sun. And I turned around and I went, "Big man," I said it was a penalty. He literally picked me up with one arm and threw me about twenty yards away. <laughs> 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 I was like, I, I, yeah, I, but the, I, I the dinner lady could have done that with you anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was a little rag doll. <laughs> <laughs> but Jock always tells the story, and this is how much of a little dick I was. This is a Scots fella calling somebody else Jock. Yeah. Um, when he was at Huddersfield this season. Before, he was English. <laughs> I played against him at Main Road, and I was at him and I was snarling, and Jock lost his temper. He literally wanted to kill me. And and then Jock tells it better. That <laughs> Jock said to himself, he went, look, just calm down. He's a little whatever. And I've turned around to him just before. I've turned around to Jock just before half time and went, "Me and you in the tunnel." <laughs> and, <I'm laughs> right. and Andy, and Andy just burst out laughing. And he thought, and he left it. He said, and he's going, he's went down the tunnel at Main Road, and I'm standing there waiting on him. He said, and all he could do was start laughing. He said, it was like Scrappy Doo. <laughs> it was sitting there. Waiting for to do. <laughs> let me at him. Again. Let me at him. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, That's anyway. I, I did have I did have one running with him, mate, and he was he was a frightening man. I mean, yeah, look, yeah. if it was in a pub, if it was in a pub and I'd had a beer, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have backed down at all. But <laughs> it was during the game, and it, I, I just he was kept pinging these balls out, and he wasn't missing. I he kept pinging his, well. I pinging his balls out from from centre back to the wingers, and I was showing every time, showing every time, and he was putting it over me head, and I just had enough, and I went, and I'm going to say it on air as well. I'm going to go. But you give me the fucking ball, you cunt. <laughs> and he's gone, what do you call me? I went, yeah. And then he's just started, his face started exploding, you know, that, when you knew he'd gone. And and he, he literally had to stop himself during the game from coming and getting me. And then half time, as we were walking off, he come and walked up alongside me, put, put his arm around me. Arm around you, yeah. Yeah. And he, he sort of crushed me a little bit. How do you, do you ever call me that again? I'll kill you. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he, he was, was amazing. Him, his, he was amazing, and he, and he gets so rightly so he gets the credit. But yeah. you, I don't think you get the credit that you deserve for what you did that season as well, mate. When you no, but don't worry, mate. I used to pat myself on the back all the time. <laughs> I know that. That's why I'm only telling you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but do you remember going back? Going back, look, the wig and the one each. People forget that you actually scored in that game. Yeah. We have an, in the in the second leg, we actually went through with a man boob. We did. We did. did. Goat with a man. Sean Goat's Sean Goat's tits. Yeah, 
<laughs> Did you not remember the song that all the lads used to sing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, yeah. mate, sing it. Sing it for the podcast. <laughs> Goater's got big boobies. <laughs> Goater's got big boobies. <laughs> <laughs> People thought it was Anne Ball, what they don't see is his right knocker actually swung out in front of his arm and made contact with the ball to put it in to win. It put us through 1-0 to get to that Wembley final. Yeah. Sean Golter's tits. I think that tops we, the Maradona. We were so lucky that night as well, by the way. Yeah, a Wasn't little it? bit. Yeah. So Are you talking bit. about the game or afterwards? <laughs> about the game. But, uh, you know, even before we came on here, and obviously everybody knows that we spoke beforehand, you know, saying think of things to talk about. I'll fast forward to, to the Blackburn game and talking about that Coulter song. You don't remember the change room afterwards when we're all celebrating? Yeah. Like, that was the next topic. That was the next topic, yeah. the Blackburn, yeah, Blackburn game, and you yeah. scoring again. And then, and then um, I think it was Jeff Whitley and Matt Kennedy. It's, all the sky cameras are in there. We're going up, every single we're going up. And Jeff Whitley starts singing, Goater's got big boobies. <laughs> 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 Why? Why and do then, you think? Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Go, go on. No, why do you think he had big tits? tits? Yeah. Why do you think? <laughs> no, I was gonna say. Why do you think the the Wembley goal uh, like had such a cult following, but the Blackburn goal didn't get that sort of it, today? It doesn't get the recognition it deserves, and it. I and think it, you're bang on. Uh, I think you're bang on with that because the, the Blackburn game was the one that got us back into the Premier League. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think. I think the Gillian game being two and all down in eighty nine minutes, um, yeah. it being at Wembley, getting back to two all, and then the penalty shootout, Leeds' celebration, there was yeah, th- 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 there was more emphasis on that at the time. There was you know more I mean? despair almost. There was more the story of despair in the beginning. Yeah. yeah can I just ask? That. Can I just ask why you're not asking why the substitution at Wembley wasn't was talked about more than the substitution at Blackburn? What, is that when we brought it was 0-0 when we brought you, you yeah. on and, the and then we were 2-0 down 2-0 <laughs> <laughs> down and then we were 2-0 yeah. down not long after <laughs> don't spoil the it game. don't spoil it changed the game massively <laughs> <laughs> yeah just in case you haven't seen the highlights that substitution was a was a real I'm just trying highlight. to get in here yeah, I'm just feeling a little bit left out yeah but you you're, know, you're, you're on the podcast every week so we can talk about whatever you want <laughs> next week <laughs> alright I'm doing it by myself next week you know, that, was, that was your birthday that was your birthday the night before as well yeah, sure was, mate. Yeah, it was. Yeah. He's forty-five. <laughs> mate, that black. Go, going back to the Blackburn game, they hit the post, the post and the bar about four times. We were one nil down. How, we were actually one nil down when it came on that time. So we, we should well, double substitution, mate. Did we come on at the same time? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, I remember you saying, I don't know if you do. You said to me on the bench just before half time, they went. <laughs> Where are we going um, tonight? No. <laughs> uh, um, well, th- th- that was a given, anyway. Um, you went to me, this game is crying out for us. Literally just yeah. before half time. You said the same thing about the pub. We, we should have <laughs> been 5 0 down at half time. Matt yeah. Hansen, Ashley Ward. Yanni hit the post about three or four times, didn't he? Yeah, yeah and then the scored. Yeah. And, and you basically went, Joe. <laughs> Not that get, and they love the gaffer done it, didn't he? He went, and yeah. this was your football brain, mate. He just he went, he needs me to calm the game down and you to stretch the game and be a pain in the backside. And then I think it was about 10 minutes into the second half, 15 minutes they brought us on, and it won all down. Yeah. And I'll pat me in the back and I'll pat you in the back when we did change the body game that day. Well, look, I mean, without me being like directly involved in any of the goals, I know, I know what I did bring was was to relax everybody and settle people down and maybe get a few more passes in than, yeah. than we were actually doing but mate you I, I, I just remember you harassing was a christian daily for one christian, of the goals yeah. and then you end up getting your own goal i think people look at at killer's goal that day because of the celebrations where he runs up to joe i think With that joe. was yeah was that the second goal or the third goal and yeah i think the christian daly's goal the, the Chris, goal got us back in it, it was, yeah the goal did yeah Kev Orlock whipped in as he did all the time. Great ball, mate. Yeah. Great yeah. player as well, by the way, Kev. Wasn't he? Well, what a lad. Oh, what a nutcase, mate. Talk about people in the dressing <laughs> What a lad. We, we need another show to actually start talking about Kev. <laughs> it's actually one of my claims shows. to fame that somebody so mental actually says that I was his hero growing up because he was a kid at West Ham. 
<laughs> and he did he did say to me once, which takes a lot of doing, to be fair, similar to what I did with, with Liam Brady and after his last game and I played alongside him. I went, can I have your shirt? And he said, why? Because all the time I'd been training with him, drinking with him, playing golf with him. I never told him he was one of my heroes, yeah. you know. So so this was similar with Kev until he came out with it one day. I think he's got Cristiano Ronaldo's shirt from one of his international games. He's got a couple of other big names now. He asked me for one of my West Ham shirts and he said it's going to take pride of place. And to have somebody like that who's just is your regular teammate, your regular nutcase. Yeah, and he was he, a nutcase. He was absolutely crackers, wasn't he? <clears throat> what, a, what a great lad. Unbelievable. I mean, um, when you go through the squad, mate, you know, look, Eddie, what a miserable git he looks like and people think he is. <laughs> but you need all them different characters to make the whole thing blend and flow. No. You know, Ger Gerard reminds me in a way of Jimmy Breaker that he wasn't directly involved with all the shenanigans, but when the shenanigans was happening, if you looked he around, there. he was always he there, was there. He with was a smile there. on his face. And similar to Goats, we talked earlier about people who don't drink him. You don't really trust them. The goats was always there uh, with a big smile. And and when you'd asked him, like, you know, yeah, you don't drink, but you're always one. He went, I can't help but want to watch you lot do exactly. what you do. A bit, a bit you know what I mean? It, it, the goat was just that high in life that you thought he was drunk half the time anyway. And he never mm. touched it. I mean, No, he didn't need it, did he? No, I mean, I funny enough, you used to bring us to all these... Uh, I remember they used to have all the parties at the hotels and that. And I think you were the only one that brought kids. Because all the... I remember Whitley... Um, all the other parents didn't allow their kids to drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I saw some things that, like, uh, like five, six years old that have stuck with me until this day. And we'd go to these parties, and you're like, "Hey, yeah, come over here and look at this." And it would—I mean, I'm not going to talk about it on the podcast, but it would be the most outrageous thing that even a teenager would see. And no, I, at I, six, I, five I, years old, I'm going, "Okay, I, I can't even <laughs> comprehend what is going on." Two females kissing or something like that, like, and you were just like, "Yeah, look at this." These two well, girls. I've never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> Show me that you video. got some memory, Con. You got some memory. <laughs> no, I do, yeah. But I remember you getting, uh, some of them, like, uh, Sean Go. I remember you, Paul, as well. Like, um, you used to play hide and seek with us and that when we were kids. And, um, at these parties, though, that's the thing. It's like, my dad would bring no, us to these. Go on. But you know what? As, as much as. As much as we were lads and we liked to have a drink and everything else, we done a lot with the families and we done a lot with the yeah. girls and nights out. Best. Yeah, we did, yeah, you know always. I mean? We always met up, always, and a night out would always, well, not always be with the girls. Always. Um, I remember we went to Marbella, didn't we? Tommy Wright and Annie. <laughs> and, and Mate, we're getting to Kathy. that. We're getting to... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Getting... So it, it wasn't just the lads on the lash constantly. The, the families were hugely involved as well. Yeah. I mean, I can I can vouch for that as well. I remember. I mean, I I, I remember all the times we we met up. I mean, I, I felt included the whole time, you know. And I'm not being paid to say this, but um, I I was included on, you know. I I remember we used to play football. Um, well, Dickie Dickie time. needed someone his own size to play with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we matched up. <laughs> I, I, I didn't tell you you did. I mean, we're not going on to that way. <laughs> yeah, actually, hey, mate, do you remember, do you remember a the trip to London? Do you remember the trip to London <laughs> with the, uh, the first remember. division? We actually went. We listened to the, was it the Charlton game? It we was beat, us or Charlton. Yeah, we beat Birmingham on the Friday night, didn't we? And it was the PFA yeah. during the Sunday, so we all decided to go down a, a little bit early. <laughs> yeah, a little bit early. <laughs> Jesus. And, and then we ended up listening to the Blackburn game together, uh, the Charlton game together, didn't we? Yeah, we all sat in a, um, a little pub in the corner, didn't we? Yeah. Not far from the hotel we were in. I mean, that was the difference with Joe. That's that's what he allowed us to do, you know? It was all obviously sanctioned by the gaffer, but he knew that we wanted to be together, and it was such an important time. Yeah. Um, but, but, but Joe as well, it, it wasn't five or six that done it. It was everybody, wasn't it? It was everybody, yeah. All or nothing yeah. it was, yeah. Oh, everybody together. And, and similar with that. the similar with the Christmas party in Dublin, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a funny. Uh, it, it, it's fitting that it's Easter weekend, isn't it? 
Uh, I know, yeah. Do you remember? I'm going to quiz you there now. Do you remember that who we played the home game before we got the police escort to the airport? We do, because I was suspended. It was Chester in the FA Cup. No, no, no. no. There was a home game. If we'd have drew with Chester in the FA Cup, we'd have played the replay on the Tuesday, which would have scuppered the Christmas party. But we played somebody at home on a Saturday. I'm going to test your knowledge here. Yeah? No. We played somebody at home on a Saturday, and then we left. Because if you remember that the Chester game was a replay, we won the replay. I was, and if, I, I was suspended, so I was at home. So I, uh, no, okay. I'm not a get out card in that one. <laughs> All right, so I, mean, I was, always, I think I was, it was always, always, always suspended around the, the time of the Christmas <laughs> party. <laughs> Funnily enough. I think it was um, Swindon at home, Kev's old, t- yeah. old team. I think we beat Swindon and we got a police escort from yeah. uh, well, I'm, to I'm the airport. All, I'm at his all at the airport. We were we were out in Dublin by eight o'clock on the Saturday <laughs> night, so the Christmas parties were just one day normally, weren't they? And we we yeah. digressed because one day wasn't enough for us. And I'd and been the being the older statesman, I went in and asked Joe, "Didn't I? Can we have the Monday off if we if we didn't have a, a replay? The replay against Jeff in the FA Cup, yeah. And we we did it on the show last week, mate, about." Singing, we're all going to Dublin after yeah, I scored me. Three, three weeks ago, I think. Yeah. <laughs> three weeks ago. Sorry, mate. That's all right. And um, yeah, well, that, that was an interesting one. But one had to put your dad to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Hey, don't yeah. worry. We have to do that every single. No, time. Yeah, no. That, that's that's <laughs> normal after the podcast. And then right? and then I got up and said, "No, I'm going to have to sleep in my own room, mate, tonight." <laughs> <laughs> after, yeah. after, <laughs> after I clean his sack out the bath, this was. <laughs> no, that was a different one. That was, <laughs> was a that different not... Christmas party. Oh, that was, that Again, we do that as well. well. That was yeah. the year after. Don't be, don't that be doing was, that. I was getting. I'm going to get to that later. Changing I've his got body some. Body. I've got some questions about that for you later. <laughs> that was a different one. See. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, other, the, 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 the Dublin one. The Dublin one was. <laughs> did the Dublin one was. Did you land any punches in the hotel? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I know I did. I know I did. Because I've still got the scar. All right, we need a we need a recap of what happened here because. <laughs> no, we story, can't. Story time. We can, we, no, we can't go into that story. We've got loads left, though. All right. Yeah, loads and loads. No, we did we did get into a little bit of a kerfuffle in the hotel on the last night. <laughs> uh, which again, we were all together. We were all together, weren't we? Yeah. It was, was a certain Mr. Whitley, if, if I remember right, as well. It could have been, yeah. He he yeah. come Sound up to me. Right, yeah. be, well, because I was in charge, I'd gone to Joe and said, "Look, don't worry. If there's any shit goes on, I'll take the blame and that." And then, obviously, uh, Jeff, who who now is is I don't think he's had a drink for about five years. He's he, he's, he's a counsellor now. For, He's Absolutely done brilliant for himself. Yeah. He's, you know, we've seen him last time I was home, and and he's quality. Such a well, you remember him, you two, don't you? When you were when you were babies, he was always yeah. the one that came over. And, oh yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. Jeff's now yeah. Jeff's now doing great stuff. But back then, him and him and Killer were a little bit off the charts, and uh, <laughs> time and bomb. <laughs> time and bomb. Them. We used to call him, yeah, because <laughs> he was always it was always going to go off. At some yeah. stage, <laughs> so so I think that night Jeff had come over and gone. Look, we're missing Manchester. We normally have a weekend. We normally go out and cause some shit in Manchester. Is it okay if we start a fight? So I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to. Uh, you didn't want to disappoint. I didn't want to let. I didn't want to let them down. I went. Oh, go on then, but hurry up. <laughs> yeah. So it, so it kicked off in the hotel, and then there was a big melee, and the guard that turned up didn't need the, the Irish police and. I don't know. It was it was just fists flying everywhere. Um, it was just us. It, yeah, it was just just a regular night out, really. Yeah. And luckily enough, not and, luckily enough, not and got back to the club. So so when we got back in training Tuesday, we were all we were all away with it. <laughs>